This conference will now be recorded. All right. Okay. We're, right. We're being recorded. Can can you see me and can you see my or can you hear me and can you see my screen? I can. Okay. I, I hear one yes and I don't hear any no's, um, so I'll proceed. So thanks everyone for coming uh, this afternoon, evening, morning, whatever it is where you are. Um, so this is lecture two or session two, and today we're going to be talking about linear and logistic regression. So those are the two types of machine learning models or machine learning methods that we're going to be talking about. But we're also going to be talking about a lot of uh, preliminary stuff, a lot of conceptual stuff like overfitting and underfitting and separating your data into training validation and testing sets. A lot of stuff that you'll need to know to do any kind of machine learning, whether it be linear regression, logistic regression, or any other type of method. Um, and for the people who weren't with us on day one, um, I'm Ryan Lagerquist and Ima Abet Upov is the other, the co-instructor for this course. So I'll just jump into it if I can change slides. Yeah. So this, ses this session will be covering uh, the topics of linear regression, logistic regression, regularization, which is a way of reducing degrees of freedom and making a simpler model, uh, training validation and testing, and then model evaluation at the end. So rock curves are probably the thing most people are familiar with, but we'll go a little bit beyond that as well. So we'll just jump right into linear regression, and then we'll talk about some preliminary conceptual stuff as we're going through linear regression. So linear regression, um, the simplest type of linear regression is just univariate. So that's this image you see on the, uh, the right-hand side, which I just grabbed off Wikipedia. So in the univariate case, you only have one predictor and one target variable. So you have an X and a Y. And usually you plot the X on the horizontal axis, the Y on the vertical axis. And then linear regression creates a line of best fit. So you have uh, your, your X is the predictor for Y, which is your target variable. And that's the um, that's the thing that you're trying to predict. Um, but you can go more general with that. You can have multivariate linear linear regression. So you can have 10 predictors, 100 predictors, 1,000 predictors, um, however many you want. Although generally, there's still only one target variable or one output variable for linear regression. Um, so linear regression fits an equation in this form. Um, you're going to see a few equations in this lecture, but don't worry about I'm not going to go through derivations or anything weird like that. Um, so this is what the equation looks like for multivariate linear regression. The beta naught, which is the first term on the right-hand side, is the bias coefficient. When you're doing univariate linear regression, that's just called the intercept. So in this uh, picture on the right, the intercept is about 5 because that's where the line crosses the, the y-axis. So in this case, your beta naught would be 5. Um, so for univariate linear regression, people call that the intercept. But for multivariate linear regression, people usually just call it the bias coefficient. Um, y, which is the one thing on the left-hand side, is the target variable. Sometimes people call that the label. Sometimes people call that the predict hand. It's the thing you're trying to predict. And then M, capital M, is the number of predictor variables. So like I said, that's usually more than one. Um, and then X subscript J is the Jth predictor variable. And beta subscript J is the coefficient for the Jth predictor variable. So this is just a, a weighted sum of all your predictor variables plus that beta naught, which is that bias coefficient. So say you have three predictor variables and the coefficients for them are 2, 4, and 8. You're going to have 2x1 plus uh, 4 times x2 plus 8 times x3 if you expand out this sum. Um, so I think I've said all I want to about this slide. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of an aside on pre-processing right now, although you're going to see more of this in the, uh, the CoLab notebook for today and then the CoLab notebooks for future lectures as well. This is just um, something I didn't want to completely skip over because pre-processing is really, really important in machine learning. Um, Ema and I have had this conversation a few times in the last few weeks, and we estimate that anywhere from 50 to 90% of the time of a machine learning practitioner is spent pre-processing your data and just getting into a getting it into a format where you can throw it into a machine learning model in the first place. So pre-processing is really, really important. Um, so to train any machine learning model, it can be linear regression, logistic regression, or or anything, you know, it could be something really fancy like a convolutional neural net. Um, your predictors need to be in a matrix and your target values need to be in a vector. So in this matrix, uh, each row is typically one example or one data point, and then each column is typically one predictor variable. So in this case, you have, as you uh, 
as you go from left to right and look down the columns, you have predictor variable one, predictor variable two, predictor variable three, dot, 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 through to predictor variable M, where M could be a hundred, a thousand, whatever. And then as you go across the rows, you have uh, the, this first row is your first example or your first observation. The second row is your second observation and the last row is your nth observation. And then you have this, um, this vector of target values. So these are the things you're trying to predict. These are the correct answers that you supply to the machine learning model. Um, so for each example, you have one correct answer. So for example, this could be um, your, your input data could be characteristics of a thunderstorm, and then your output variable could be the maximum hail size produced by the thunderstorm. So Y1 would be the hail size for the first storm, Y2 would be the hail size for the second storm, and Y sub N would be the hail size for the nth storm. Um, anyways, as you can yeah, imagine, yeah. you're, yes. So I just wanted to add, if you have more complex problems that you're trying to solve, maybe the output is an image, then, you know, the output wouldn't be a vector, then you would have different images for the different outputs. So it doesn't have to be a vector, it could be something more complex. Yeah, totally true. And uh, we'll get to, I think we'll get to problems like that in lecture five and lecture six, so towards the end of the course. Um, so as you can imagine, when you're working with atmospheric data, you have 2D grids and 3D grids, and you have time series, and sometimes you have 4D grids. So creating this, this nice matrix with your predictive variables and this nice vector with your output variables requires a lot of spatial and temporal processing. So for example, in the CoLab notebook that you're going to see at the end of today, and this is the, um, the same data set that we're, that we're going to use for all the CoLab notebooks in this course. Um, there will be one target variable. That target variable is the maximum future vorticity in, inside a thunderstorm. So we're going to be training machine learning models to predict if a thunderstorm will achieve strong rotation or not. And then the predictor variables are all these things listed below. If you count them up, there's 41 different predictor variables. So there's a whole bunch of spatial statistics based on the composite reflectivity inside the storm. So for each storm, we have sort of a polygon outline telling you which grid cells are inside the storm. And then we take a bunch of spatial statistics over those grid cells to create predictor variables. So the statistics are the minimum, maximum, average, standard deviation, and then five different percentiles of, uh, so those statistics are applied to all composite reflectivity values inside the storm, and then all two meter temperatures inside the storm, and then all 10 meter V winds inside the storm, and then all 10 meter U winds inside the storm. And then also we have some uh, parameters some predictors that are based on the shape of the storm. So there's the storm's orientation, at major and minor axis, its eccentricity, and its area. Um, so the, the whole point of listing these out here, you'll, you'll see a lot more detail in the notebooks. So you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. It's just to emphasize that when you're trying to create this nice, tidy predictor matrix and this nice, tidy target vector, there's often a lot of spatial and temporal processing that goes on. And also in this case, there's storm tracking involved to figure out that a storm at, at time T1 is linked is the same thing as uh, as the other snapshot of the storm at time T2 and time T3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we'll go back to linear regression for now. Um, so during training, the, uh, the adjustable parameters of the model or the learnable parameters of the model are these betas. So beta naught is the bias coefficient and then beta j is the coefficient for the j's predictor variable. So those are the things that are learned during training or adjusted in a way to make them better fit the observations. So when you're training linear regression or any other kind of machine learning model, you give it the predictors and then you give it the correct answers and it tries to learn a relationship that, that gets its predictions as close to the correct answers as possible. Um, so to be a little more specific about this, these coefficients, the beta naught and the beta j, are adjusted in a way that makes them minimize the mean squared error. That's why people often call it least squares linear regression instead of just linear regression. Um, so in other words, mean squared error here is the loss function. Um, more generally, for any type of machine learning model, whether it be linear regression or something fancier, the loss function measures the amount of error incurred by your machine learning models, the amount of error in the predictions, and you want to minimize the loss function because you want to get the error as close to zero as possible. Um, so the training procedure adjusts the parameters inside the machine learning model. For linear regression, those parameters are the beta naught and the beta j, with the goal of minimizing the loss function. <clears throat> So mean squared error, for, for people who haven't seen the equation, it's, um, it's not very fancy. It's defined below. 
So this is uh, this sigma thing is a summation. Y hat sub i is the predicted value for the ith example. Y sub i is the observed value for the, the for the ith example. So this um, this difference here is just the the square difference between the predicted value and the true value. And then you sum them up over all n examples, and then you divide by n to get a mean. So that's mean squared error. Um, and then for uh, for y hat subscript i, the uh, the predicted value for the ith example, to make the notation consistent with equation one, we can add the um, yeah. So to make the notation consistent between equ equation one and equation two, we can add the subscript i in here. So this is just um, Equation three is the same thing as equation one, except we've added the subscript i to uh, to be super explicit and and to say this is for the ith example only. Um, so the next two slides are actually going to have a derivation. I think there's there's a point to going through this derivation, but if you, I'm I'm not going to go through every line of the derivation, and if you don't care about the nitty gritty math, you can feel free to just zone out for the next two slides or something. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. Um, the whole point of showing the next two slides is to show you how the training procedure for linear regression works. So we have these coefficients, these beta naught and beta j, and we want to adjust the coefficients in a way that gives us the best fit, which is the same thing as minimizing the mean squared error. Um, and this procedure is called gradient descent. So we, we figure out the, um, the gradient of the mean squared error with respect to each one of those coefficients, and then we adjust each one of those coefficients in the opposite direction. Um, so in a way that, that based on the gradient, we think would decrease the, the mean squared error. So the next two slides are gonna drive the update rule for gradient descent. Um, there is a technical note here as well, which could, is that, uh, yeah. Sorry, could I jump in one more time? But, yeah. Two. Okay, I just wanted to make the point that the, the reason why Ryan is going through this, oh, there's an echo somehow for me, but anyway, so the reason why, why Ryan is going through this linear regression is because it's a very similar process for many different machine learning uh, derivations. And so whenever we speak of gradient descent later on and loss function, all that stuff, you've seen it from linear regression, you know linear regression already. So um, because of that, you can then kind of generalize out from there. So I think that's the main point. Is the audio really horrible right now? It's, it's a little bit echoey, but it's not that bad. I can okay. hear you. OK. All right. But again, the key point being, we're going through this as an example so that we can generalize from that for machine learning later, just to make that clear. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good uh, addition. So. One technical note here um, for the people who've seen linear regression in, in maybe their statistics, statistics classes or something like that, uh, there is an alternative to gradient descent, which is called matrix inversion. That's a direct way of solving the linear regression problem. So you end up with this matrix vector equation, and then you take the inverse of the matrix, and you rearrange it, and you can solve for the coefficients. Um, the advantage of matrix inversion is that it's a closed form solution, so it's not an iterative thing, whereas gradient descent is an iterative thing. So uh, typically you go through like a thousand iterations or 10,000 iterations of gradient descent and you wait until the error converges so the error is no longer decreasing and then you stop doing gradient descent. Um, whereas with matrix inversion, you only have to do it once. It's not this weird iterative thing. Uh, the disadvantage of matrix inversion is that the matrix, which is the, um, it's the matrix of, of predictor values. So this, um, this thing with all the X's that I was showing you back here, that matrix may not be invertible, and if it's not invertible, well, you can't do matrix inversion, so then you're stuck with gradient descent. Um, and the non-invertibility of the matrix becomes more likely as the matrix becomes bigger. So as the number of predictors increases and the number of examples increases, the likelihood that you can't invert that matrix increases. And even if you can invert the matrix, if you have a million examples and a thousand predictors, so you've got a matrix with a billion entries, matrix inversion is really, really slow and um, most people's computers will run out of memory if you try to do matrix inversion on a matrix that big. Um, but if you really care about seeing the math for matrix inversion, there's an appendix at the end of the slides that we're not gonna go through today, but it shows you the alternative to gradient descent and it shows you exactly how that's done. Um, hey, Ryan, quick so question here, on that. Yes. Um, it, does the matrix inversion always find the 
minimum because I know right yeah. the uh, iterative could find a local minimum but not the absolute minimum. Yeah, matrix inversion uh, isn't guaranteed to find a global minimum either, and especially um, often what happens is the matrix is invertible. It's technically invertible, but it's ill-conditioned. Um, that's a that's a linear algebra thing that I can't explain super well. But often when you have big matrices with with lots of um, with the predictor variables that have a lot of interdependence, the uh, the matrix will become ill-conditioned, which means that yes, you can invert it, but the inversion isn't very accurate. So often matrix inversion ends up performing worse than gradient descent because you have an ill-conditioned matrix, so you get a weird inverse of it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so these are the, the slides that you were warned about with the weird derivations. Um, I'll, so I'm, I'm not going to go through every line of this. Um, all, all I want to say is what we're doing is we're um, writing mean squared error in terms of the coefficients. So this uh, th this first equation that you see here, if you don't look at anything to the right of the second equal sign yet, so just this stuff on the left-hand side, MSE equals this um, 1 over N times the sum of blah, blah. That's just the definition for mean squared error, which you saw a few slides back. But you can also um, you can substitute for y hat subscript i, which is the predicted value for the ith example. And you can substitute the coefficients in here. The whole purpose of substituting the coefficients in here is that now we can find the derivative of MSE with respect to each coefficient. So this derivation here is finding the derivative of MSE with respect to the bias coefficient, which is beta naught. And this derivation on the next slide is finding the derivative of MSE mean squared error with respect to beta subscript k, which is just any one of the coefficients that's not beta zero. So it's beta subscript k where k is greater than zero. And what you end up finding is that, so there's there's this last line here, this is the result of the derivation. So the derivative of MSE with respect to beta naught is just two over n times the difference between the predicted and real value. And then for beta subscript k, the kth coefficient, the derivative of mean squared error with respect to beta sub k is 2 over n times the sum of the uh, the differences between the predicted and the actual times the uh, times the predictor uh, the the predictor value as well. So if this predictor variable is temperature, for example, then x subscript i k will be temperature for the ith example. So you just have an extra multiplicative factor in here. Um, the whole point of of finding these uh, finding these derivatives is that when you do gradient descent, you want to update your coefficients in the opposite way. So if you find that um, for for uh, coefficient beta sub j, for example, if you find that the derivative of MSE with respect to beta sub j is positive, that means as you increase beta sub j, you increase the mean squared error. So if you want to decrease the mean squared error, you decrease beta sub j. And then the opposite is true as well. If you find the derivative of MSE with respect to beta sub j is negative, then you want to increase beta sub j because that should decrease the MSE. So that's where this whole update rule comes from, and that's the payoff of all the silly derivations on the last couple slides. Um, so this uh, this this top line here, or this bottom line, if you prefer uh, something more explicit, these are just different statements of the update rule for gradient descent. So for each one of the, the coefficients beta sub j, at, at each iteration of linear regression, you adjust that beta sub j. So beta sub j becomes beta sub j minus alpha times the derivative of MSE with respect to beta sub j. And this alpha is the learning rate. That's a user-selected parameter or a hyperparameter. So that's something you have to choose a priori. That alpha isn't something that can be learned during training. That's just something you choose before you start running linear regression. And often, to um, a, a good rule for alpha is that it should be a really small number. So technically, it can be anywhere between 0 and 1. Um, but you want it to be much closer to 0. So I usually start with 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 or even 10 to the minus 6. But this is something that if you're doing linear regression and you really want to find the best model, you want to experiment with alpha. So try 10 different values, 20 different values, 100 different values to figure out which one works best. Um, so like I said, this gradient descent procedure is iterative. So that means equation five, the update rule, is applied to the training data many, many times until your mean squared error converges or bottoms out. So often, if you can see my finger drawing a very low-tech error graph, um, usually as you 
as, as you keep iterating, your mean squared error will go down like this, kind of a, as an exponential decay curve. And eventually that exponential decay bottoms out and the mean squared error stops decreasing. So that's where you want to stop training. That's when you say, okay, MSE has converged and the model I've ended up with is good enough. Okay, so section three is on logistic regression, which is a, um, it's a generalization of linear regression that does classification. So if you're, if you're trying to predict the probability of a binary event, such as tornado or no tornado, you end up using, you can end up using logistic regression instead of linear. Um, but before I jump into that, are there any questions? I know I've thrown a lot of technical stuff at people in the first 20 minutes, so I want to make sure I haven't lost anyone. No, it's all good stuff, Ryan. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, one positive comment and zero questions. So I'll take that as a good sign and uh, keep forging ahead. So, yeah, I already um, I said this in words, but I'll read off the slide just so you hear it in a different way. Um, so as the name suggests, uh, linear regression is meant for regression or predicting continuous values. So often in machine learning, we have this dichotomy between regression and classification. When we say regression, we're, um, regression means the prediction of a continuous value. So some examples of continuous values are temperature and wind speed, because temperature can, uh, can take on an infinite number of values. It can be minus 40.000 Celsius. This is a, a very Canadian version of this course with these, uh, these low temperatures. It can be minus 40.001 Celsius. It can be minus 40.000001 Celsius, et cetera. Um, so because temperature can take on an infinite number of values, it's a continuous variable. And the same thing with wind speed as well. Um, but if you're doing binary classification instead, so if you're trying to predict the probability of an event, you, you start with this equation here. So this is the equation for linear regression. Can anyone think of a way to adapt this equation and make it make it output probabilities instead? Um, I'm not sure, Ryan, but isn't that what OEM does? Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't hear what you said, sorry. I said, I, I'm not sure about the answer, but isn't what uh, OEM does this one, optimal estimation method? Uh, yeah, probably. I think optimal estimation method is a um, another term for linear and logistic regression. So I, I think you're on the right track. Um, so so what you do to um, to make this to make this do binary classification is you um, you just adjust the equation. So instead of having y on the left hand side, you take the logit of the left hand side. That's what this function is called. So uh, ln or natural logarithm of y divided by one minus y is called the logit function. And then if you rearrange, that's what these next lines are doing. So uh, on this, this top line here, you have ln of y over 1 minus y equals a bunch of stuff. And then going through the derivation here, I'm just isolating y and rearranging so that you can end up with an equation that only has y on the left-hand side. Um, so you can look at whichever version of the equation you prefer. You can look at equation 6, which is the top line, or equation 7, which is the bottom line. They're both the same thing, but this is the logistic regression equation. So this is a um, an extension of linear regression. And if you look at the right-hand side here on equation 7, which is the bottom line, you should be able to convince yourself that y has to vary from 0 to 1. Because if you look at this exponential term, so now all the coefficients are inside the exponential term. So you still have your beta naught plus your sum of beta sub j times x sub j. So beta naught is still the bias coefficient, x sub j is still the jth predictor variable, beta sub j is still the coefficient for the jth predictor variable. You still have capital M predictor variables. Um, but now all this stuff is inside an exponential function. Um, so if you look at this equation, you should be able to convince yourself that if if the exponential is uh, is zero, then you're going to have zero in the numerator, and you're going to have one plus zero, so one in the denominator, so y is going to be zero. Whereas if this exponential goes up to infinity, you're going to have infinity in the numerator and one plus infinity in the denominator. One plus infinity is still infinity, so you're going to have infinity over infinity. 
which uh, the limit ends up being 1. So that means y on the left-hand side has to vary between 0 and 1. Um, and that's good if you're trying to predict the probability of something, because probabilities also have to range between 0 and 1. Um, so that's why we did that whole transformation to go from linear to logistic regression. Um, so like I said, the, uh, the predictions which come from the left-hand side of this equation have to range between 0 and 1. But for a binary classification problem, the observations um, are uniquely 0 or 1. So a yes is a 1 and a, a no is a 0. So for example, if you're predicting tornadoes for storms where a tornado happened, those storms are labeled with a 1. And for storms where a tornado didn't happen, uh, those storms are labeled with a 0. And sometimes people call 0 the non-event and 1 the event. So 0 would be your non-tornado and 1 would be your tornado. Um, the loss function for logistic regression. So basically, there, there's two things about logistic regression that really differ from linear regression. One is the prediction equation. So instead of having y on the left-hand side, you've got this logit thing, this ln of y over 1 minus y. That's the one big difference between linear and logistic. And the other big difference between linear and logistic is the loss function. So instead of using mean squared error, which is the loss function for linear regression, you use something called the cross entropy when you're doing logistic regression. And the cross entropy is defined down here. So again, capital N is just the number of examples or the number of observations you have. Y sub I is the true value for the ith example, which can be only zero or one. And then y hat subscript i is the predicted value, which is now a probability for the ith example. So that's something between 0 and 1. And then log sub 2 is the logarithm in base 2. And the reason we have logarithm in base 2 here instead of natural log or logarithm in base 10 or something is that this equation comes from information theory. So conceptually, um, I don't know the derivation of this equation, but I don't think anyone wants to see more derivations today anyways. So conceptually, cross entropy is the number of bits of information you need to describe the difference between two distributions. And in this case, the two distributions are the distribution of the predictions, which are probabilities, and then the distribution of true labels, which are zeros and ones. So if all your predictions are perfect, if you predict probability of zero for every non-event and probability of one for every event, your cross entropy will be zero. And if, you, if your predictions are really, really wrong, your cross entropy will increase towards infinity. So in other words, it's a negatively oriented score, which means that lower values are better. Um, and also in this image on the right-hand side, which again, I've just ripped from Wikipedia, you can see on the left-hand um, part of this image, what happens if you have a binary classification problem, but then you try to use uh, linear regression as the prediction method, all your, um, all your true values are your, or your labels are either zero or one. Um, and linear regression is going to try to fit a straight line to this, and the straight line usually ends up being not a very good fit. Whereas when you do logistic regression, these green dots are the same as on the left-hand side, so your true labels are all either 0 or 1, but then logistic regression fits this S-shaped curve or this sigmoid-shaped curve, and you generally get a closer fit to your observations with logistic regression. So that's why you want to do that for... Um, for binary classification problems instead of just blindly applying linear regression to it. Um, so I've already told you the two big differences between linear and logistic regression. So the, uh, the gradient descent rule for linear regression um, basically works for logistic regression as well. The, um, the update rule is almost identical. Uh, the only difference is the update rule for linear regression. So this... Um, this, this top line of math or this top equation on the slide, the update rule for linear regression, instead of having epsilon, which is the cross entropy in the, the numerator here, for linear regression, you have MSE, which is the mean squared error. So that's the only difference. You take the loss function for linear regression and replace it with the loss function for logistic regression. And this becomes the update rule when you're doing gradient descent for logistic regression. Um, with all this stuff, Sid, with all this theory and math that I've thrown at you, um, which isn't going to happen very often in the course, I promise. Um, we're not going to have a lot of derivations going on. Um, if, you're, if you want to use linear regression or logistic regression or any other kind of machine learning model, you're not going to have to do all this programming yourself. So you're not going to have to program gradient descent with the update rule. Um, I think, like Ema said, it's a really good idea to understand how this works because gradient descent is used for a bunch of different types of machine learning models. Um, but you're never going to have to code this up yourself. You're going to use someone else's implementation in scikit-learn or 
one of the many other Python libraries that do this stuff. Okay, so before I jump into section four on regularization, I'll uh, I'll take a breather and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, hey Ryan, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, just with the logistic regression, you mentioned it's for binary classification. Can you also do it for non-binary classification? So I guess more than two options. Yeah, there's a multi-class version of logistic regression that um, I, I didn't put it in the lecture today because we just don't have time to get into it. Um, but if you'd like, I can send you some literature on that if you um, if you ping me by email or something. Okay, I was just curious, yeah, if it existed. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, and the formulas are very, very, very similar. It's just instead of two different states, you have n different states. So it really generalizes very quickly. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I have a question. Um, my question is, is sometimes in the literature you hear something called deviance. Is that the same thing as your entropy measure? Oh, whew. Um, I don't think so. Usually when people talk about deviance, they're specifically talking about decision trees, which is something we'll get into in the next lecture. So that's next week. Um, and I'll do some research, actually, because deviance isn't a term that I typically use, um, but I'll make sure that I get it into the lecture next week. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Ryan, I have a question, too. Could you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. Make sure I. Uh, one more, please. I'm sorry. Trying to find the right one. Bingo. Okay, so on this one, the first sentence there, you know, these equations ensure that y is minus 0, 1, so it can be treated as a probability. I guess my question <clears throat> is it, the y in this case actually isn't a probability though, correct? It's simply that you've mapped it into a space that lies between zero and one because your predict bands themselves are either zero or one. And you're trying to see how close you can be or predict zeros correctly or predict ones correctly. Um, but the space allows for values between zero and one. I just wanna, I've always had problems with problems with probability and statistics. So when you say it's treated as a probability, it's just because it lies between zero and one, not because it's actually a probability. Is that correct? <laughs> That's a good point. Um, I think that could lead us down a very philosophical rabbit hole of of what is a true probability. I, I think you could um you could get a room full of statisticians having a brawl over that question. So I, I don't know, I might balk on that question because I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure myself what a true probability is. Can I jump in here? Just one, one comment. I think you are absolutely right. And that's, that's a common confusion. And that's often because the literature often says it's like a probability, people treat it as a probability. I think it's some kind of confidence that the algorithm has that it's either zero or one, but it's really not a probability, strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. People often treat it as a probability, but strictly speaking, it is not a probability. You're absolutely right. Statistically speaking, it's not a probability. But you can kind of use it as some sort of confidence. So, and that's what people do. And then you have to be really careful and not say that it's a probability, because strictly speaking, that's just wrong. So, uh, I think that's a better way Okay, so section four is on regularization, and then you'll hear from Ema for a while for section five before we go to section six. Um, so regularization is the whole business of creating a simpler model to avoid overfitting. So it's a fancy word for a pretty simple thing. Um, overfitting is something that happens when the model makes good predictions on training data, but then doesn't generalize well to new data. So you can, um, you can overfit eccentricities of your training data that just don't generalize to the real world. And that becomes more likely as your training data set becomes smaller as well. So you could learn some silly relationship like when the reflectivity is 56.74 dBZ, there's always a tornado. You know, if you had a training set with only one tornadic storm in it, you could learn some sort of silly relationship like that. So that's kind of a reductio ad absurdum for overfitting. Um, 
So here's an example where overfitting might happen. Um, so in this case, we have a really tiny data set with only three storms. We're trying to predict if there's going to be a tornado. And in this case, we've misguidedly included storm ID as one of the predictor variables. Um, so these storm IDs you often see when you run a tracking algorithm and they're arbitrary. But you know, if you naively just threw every piece of data you had into a machine learning model, it could start learning from these storm IDs. So if you look at this tiny table, we have some predictor variables that have actual physical meaning like temperature and dew point. Um, but you could learn a relationship like if the storm ID equals C, there's going to be a tornado. And if the storm ID equals A and B, there's not going to be a tornado. Um, obviously, since storm ID isn't a physically meaningful quantity, that's a rule that's probably not going to generalize to new data. When your storm ID is C, you're probably not going to always get a tornado. Um, so the model would end up having 100% accuracy on the training data in this case, the tiny training set that only has three storms. Um, but this probably isn't a very good rule. So regularization is a way of preventing silly things like that from happening. Although in the in the really absurd example I just gave here, um, <clears throat> the the easiest thing to do would just not be include storm would be just not to include storm ID as a predictor because it's not a physically meaningful quantity. Um, so you can think of regularization as removing degrees of freedom. That's another definition for that term. And it can be done in many different ways. Um, so regularization doesn't always have to be a fancy machine learning method. So in the example I just showed you, regularization could just mean removing storm ID from the predictors. So using three predictor variables instead of four. Um, but another common approach, and this is what you'll see in the notebook at the end of today, and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this uh, section, is putting regularization inside the loss function. So this can be done by adding the L1 and L2 terms, or L1 and L2 penalties, sometimes people call them. And they're just, uh, those are defined in these equations here. So the L1 penalty is the, again, capital M is the number of predictor variables, and J is just a subscript for the Jth predictor variable. So the L1 penalty is the sum of absolute values of all the coefficients, and the L2 penalty is the sum of squares of all the coefficients. So this is something you could use for linear or logistic regression. Um, or neural networks as well, which you'll see later. <clears throat> so with regularization, if your original loss function is J, so for example, that J could be mean squared error or cross entropy. If your original loss function is just J, when you do regularization, your loss function becomes J plus these two terms. So you've got lambda one times the L1 penalty plus lambda two times the L2 penalty. Uh, lambda one and lambda two are hyperparameters. So they're sort of, um, I hesitate to call them magic numbers, but they're, they're user-defined values that you have to play around with to, to figure out what gives you the best model. So you have to decide what you want to be the strength of the L1 penalty, what should be the strength of the L2 penalty. Um, and then these end up these terms end up being added to your loss function. So basically what this means, because L1 and L2 are sums of the coefficient values, this means that your model ends up getting punished not just for making bad predictions, which is this J term, MSE or cross entropy or something like that, but the model is also punished for having really large coefficient values. So this encourages the model to have smaller coefficient values, which generally equates to having a simpler model. Um, and there's a real fundamental difference between the L1 and L2 penalties. So the L1 penalty pushes coefficients to become exactly zero which is why some people call it the lasso penalty, because it's like throwing a lasso around a small subset of your predictors. It's a weird term. Um, and then the L2 penalty is sometimes called the ridge penalty. Um, so the whereas the L1 penalty pushes coefficients to become exactly zero, the L2 penalty doesn't do that. It pushes coefficients to become really small, but not exactly zero. The reason is inside the L2 penalty, you're squaring the coefficient values. So once a coefficient value has become small enough, like 10 to the minus 6, and then you square it, that, that's 10 to the minus 12. Um, once coefficient values are that small, there's really no pressure to keep decreasing them all the way to 0. Um, one sort of uh, uh, one word of caution here for, uh, for when you're reading papers and whatnot is that often people will use both penalties. They use the L1 and L2 penalties on top of linear logistic regression. Those are really popular choices. And then they'll call the resulting model an elastic net regression. 
Um, but that's wrong because L1 and L2 penalties can be used for any model that has coefficient values. So they can be used for uh, logistic regression, linear regression, neural networks, and a whole bunch of other different types of machine learning models. So when someone says they used elastic net regression, they're not telling you what the base machine learning model is. All they're telling you is that they used L1 and L2 penalties. Usually when people say elastic net regression, they mean they used L1 and L2 with linear regression, but that's not always clear. Um, so the correct terminology would be linear regression with an elastic net penalty or logistic regression with an elastic net penalty, etc. cetera. Um, maybe that's just a pet peeve of mine. I'm not sure. I've seen it quite a few times. Um, and then those update rules for gradient descent, I'm not going to dwell too much on these slides, but um, if, you're, if you're really keen and paying attention to the equations you saw earlier, you'll notice that uh, when you add L1 and L2 regularization, now you've changed the form of the loss function, and if you change the loss function, you have to change the update rule for gradient descent because the, the derivative of the loss function with respect to each coefficient value is now it's uh, the derivative of J subscript reg with respect to the coefficient value and not just the derivative of j with respect to the coefficient value so you have to do some tweaking for the update rule and this is what you end up getting so this top set of equations here is for linear regression and the bottom set of equations is for logistic regression so you end up with a couple new terms in your update rule <clears throat> all right so the last slide for regularization is that um Really, there, there's all these fancy methods you can use to do regularization, like L1 and L2, and there's other stuff you'll see later in the course, like a dropout, for example. Um, but a really, maybe the most important type of regularization is just the type of model that you choose. So if you have a problem that's where the, the relationship between the predictors and the output variable is linear, you probably want to use linear regression. If you have a problem where it's polynomial, maybe you want to use poly polynomial regression. If you have a problem where the relationship is really complex, maybe you want to use something fancy like convolutional neural nets. Um, but in general, if the model is too complex for the data, it's probably going to overfit and you'll have a bad time. And if the model is too simple for the data, it's probably going to underfit and you'll have a bad time. Um, so I've created, uh, created, uh, ripped a, a comic off XKCD and, and put it in my slides. And... Um, this, this has a bunch of different examples where you have a scatter plot. The scatter plot is the same in every one of these panels. And there's examples of different models being, uh, being applied to the data. So if you look at these different panels, you'll see that some models overfit, some models underfit. Some are completely inappropriate. They just give you the wrong type of function for the data at hand. And some of these fits are actually reasonable. Um, and I'm wondering if we can just take a couple minutes. You can um, probably put your answers in the chat so we don't have everyone trying to talk at the same time. Um, but can people diagnose which or which? So may maybe just pick uh, just pick three panels or something and say, of those three panels you picked, which ones overfit, which, which ones are examples of overfitting, which are examples of underfitting, et cetera. Okay, Alex says the bottom left and the bottom middle overfit. Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah, the, the bottom left is probably the most egregious example of overfitting where you, um, you, you make the line go through every single data point, neglecting that there's, um, you know, there, there's obviously some, some information here that, that you don't have that you would need to make perfect predictions because in this case, um, this, this is a univariate problem. So you have your one predictor variable on the x-axis and then your one target variable on the y-axis. And if you look at this relationship, it's quite clear that having this one predictor variable, you just don't have enough information to, um, to make perfect predictions. So if you uh, fit a model like this one on the bottom left, the connecting lines model, you're just fooling yourself into thinking that you have enough information to make good predictions. Um, <clears throat> What other answers did we get? The bottom row is overfitting. Um, yeah, definitely. So the connecting lines model is overfitting. Uh, 
the ad hoc filter, I don't know if I would say that's overfitting. Um, it, it, it's not touching every single data point. It, um, I, I think if anything for the ad hoc filter, what I would say is that the, the form of the function you fit to the data is inappropriate. Uh, you, you can imagine that if you, if, if you sampled more data and put more data points in the scatter plot, they probably wouldn't follow the relationship that you get with the ad hoc filter. Um, and then the house of cards model, uh, again, I don't know if I would say that's an example of overfitting. I would say that's an example of the um, the fitted relationship being completely inappropriate. Because once you extrapolate just a little bit, you go off a little bit to the right, and uh, all, all of a sudden you get this weird polynomial relationship where if you collect new data, it's almost certainly not going to fit this polynomial relationship. <clears throat> um, I clicked smooth in Excel. Where's that one? Oh, that's the connecting lines example. Yes, connecting lines way overfits. Ugh. A lot of people are uh, are honing in on that, so that's good. And another person says the bottom row contains examples of overfitting, connecting lines overfits, the linear regression underfits. Um, yeah, I would say so. That's the uh, the example at the top left here. I would say that's probably an example of underfitting. To me, the exa the um, the examples that look most reasonable are the uh, the quadratic fit and the the exponential fit, and maybe the loss fit as well. Uh, the linear regression with no slope, which is the uh, the second row right hand column, that's definitely example an example of underfitting. Uh, the logistic fit also looks quite reasonable. The piecewise fit looks reasonable. Um, so I would say about half of these fits look reasonable, although it's hard to tell when you have so little data. Um, but I'm glad people honed in on the eg egregious examples of overfitting. Um, so Ema, should I let you take over for section five now? Sure. Okay. And I try, so for today, we're hoping for 75 minutes. I was off. Let me try something different. Let me try taking my hands off. Okay. I think I think a lot of the noise is coming from caller one. I don't know who that is, um, and I don't know how to mute people on here. Yes, I'm seeing one of the caller lines show up as well. Let me see whether I can do that. I don't. I know how to mute other participants, but not our phone calls. <clears throat> but I think it's getting better now. Yeah, I don't think I have the power to mute people, Ema. Um, but it says if if you want to mute an attendee, you can. Oh, okay. It says that person left, anyways. <laughs> Um, but I guess for I future reference, I, I think I you can um, you can click on their name and there will be an option to mute them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's no one. I, I didn't see them. Uh, some of them do and some of them don't. So I I unmute, I unmute one. So let's see whether that works. I think it's better. Okay, let's go back to the slides. And also for today, we had planned 75 minutes of lecture and 15 minutes of, of collab. Next week, it's 60 and 30. But let's make sure we don't exceed our 75 so we have enough space enough time. So can you go back to the slides, sharing your slides? Ryan, going to section five. Yes, here we go. One back. Okay, here we go. So we're going to talk a little about training, validation, and testing. Um, and so the idea here is that you want to develop a machine learning model. Um, you want to have three different data sets. Number one, is used for training. So you learn the model parameters, such that as the coefficients of your linear regression model. Number two is validation, where you kind of tune your model. So you choose the so-called hyperparameters, and we'll have examples of that in a second. And number three is really for testing. So you're done with model development, and you now want to see for data that you haven't touched before how your model is performing. So again, going through a model parameter, what you do in training, you train a model with the model parameters, and those can be coefficients on an endogistic regression, 
So it has a threshold in the decision tree, and those are the weights in the neural network. So that's what the machine learning algorithm automatically learns given the training data. A hyperparameter is something that is usually chosen by the user, but it could also be chosen by an external loop. But let's say the user uh, chooses it. It's something like the learning rate for linear log logistic regression. It might be the number of iterations for linear logistic regression, the depth of a decision tree, or the number of layers in your network. Um, so those are things. So it could even be the method that you're using. OK, next slide, please. So here you kind of see the usual proportions of training, validation, and, and testing data sets. And the idea here really is you have a certain amount of data available, a certain number of samples that you can use. And your machine learning methods are usually very hungry for data. If you use linear regression, you need the least data. But the more complex your method gets, random forest needs a little more, neural networks need even more. And they become more and more hungry for data. And in our applications, almost always, we don't have enough samples, not as many as we would like to have, ideally. So we're kind of stretched anyway. So what we usually do is that we use as many, we want to use as many samples as possible for training. But if we use them all for training, we have nothing left. So quite often, you know, you use like the big portion of it, say either 60% or 80% for training, and then only 20% or 10% each for validation and testing. But you have to make sure you still have enough samples and testing and validation, because otherwise it's really not representative of how your neural network works. If you only test on one sample, it just doesn't tell you much. So you, it's kind of a trade-off, but that's why people often use 60, 20, 20, or 80, 10, 10. Next slide, please. OK, here now I've broken it up a little and put the training and the validation data both under model development. Because what happens, as we said before, the training data set is going to be used by your algorithm to automatically find things like the coefficients in a linear regression model. But once you've done that and you've only basically have trained your model on the same set of data, you now want to see how would it work on something that wasn't in my data set, because you want to know whether it just memorized the correct answers for the training samples that you had. And so that's where the validation data set comes into play, where you basically test how is my model now doing on uh, the data that I haven't seen yet. But this is still part of the model development, because you still probably have a feedback loop where you go back and you say, you know what, this didn't work so well. Let's tune some parameters. Let's have more predictions, or let's change the uh, lengths of conversion of training or something like this. And then you go back and you train again, and you see how it was enders. But now your data and your validation data set has become contaminated because you've used it to tune your model. So what you really want to do is you want to have this testing data set that you do not touch at all during model development that you keep for the very end. So once you've you know, you've played with your training and your validation data, and you decide this is the method I want to use, these are the hyperparameters I want to use, this is my final model. That's when you bring in the testing data set, which the model has not seen at all at that point, and test it for that. And it's really, really hard to keep your hands off the testing data. And especially once you use the testing data, you're not supposed to change your model at all. You're not supposed to go back and say, oh, I wonder whether the other model was better and then switch around, because this is really your test, like you developed it and you want to see how it works in the real world. And if you then go back and you make changes, you again have a contaminated data set because you use this one now also for model development. And I have to tell you, I've made the mistake often that I kind of messed around had my testing data set used too early or didn't clearly separate between validation and testing. It happens extremely easily. So it's really, really hard. But when, whenever you, want, you attempt to use your testing data set, you need to step your own hand and say, nope, I'm leaving this until the very end. OK, next slide. OK. So again, the performance on the testing data gives an indication of how well the model will perform in the wild. In the wild meaning like in the real world, in the operational world. Um, and so training, validation, testing data must be totally exclusive. And it's actually not trivial to make them exclusive. So the three data sets should be really mutually independent. So let's say you're developing a model to predict tornadoes. And each of your data points is one storm at one time step. And the time steps are only one minute apart. 
So the question is, should you split the data randomly into training validation testing? So for each one, each minute you say, okay, randomly I assign it to training validation or testing. Could there be a problem with that? Anyone? Let's say I do that. Let's say I do that randomly for each minute, for each sample. I put it on either testing, training, or validation. Do you see any kind of problem with that? Anyone? I'll try, Emma. Uh, I don't think you you would not split these data randomly. They're yeah, would... they're associated with one storm and are not mutually independent. One is growing from the other. There's they're not separate storms. Exactly. So next slide, please. Well, that's exactly the problem. So if you take, for example, storm A and you just separate it by minute, I mean the storm hasn't changed that much. The meteorological conditions haven't changed that much which means that now you have the danger of your, of your machine learning method memorizing the correct result and just repeating it then for the validation and testing because it's so similar to what it's seen before that is really not an independent sample. And so um, we call this temporal autocorrelation because you know between 12 o'clock and 12 one it's so closely related that there's pretty strong autocorrelation between those two samples. Um, and so that becomes a problem as we just discussed. Um, so next slide, please, on how we can avoid this. So different ways to ensure that your training, validation, and testing are independent. On number one, you can do object independence. So in that case, you just make sure that everything that is in one data set, that everything that comes from one storm, for example, ends up in the same data set. If you have any samples from storm A, in the training data set, then all of them have to be in the training data set so that there's really no intersection between storms and different data sets. Or you can do temporal independence, which means, for example, you try to split it by year. And since the storms usually are within one year, the year then automatically guarantees that you have object independence as well. And sometimes you may want to do spatial independence, especially if you want to test how well your algorithm generalizes to other locations. So you may say, okay, I'm only going to take data points from certain locations in my training data, and I keep other locations, all the samples for the other locations out, and then I'm gonna test later on how my model that I trained on some locations will work on the other ones to, to test the generalization in that uh, spatial respect. Okay, next slide. Hyperparameter tuning. We talked about hyperparameters briefly before, so hyperparameters, again, are these variables are outside of the main training loop that you choose. It could be the number of layers in your network. It could be if you do polynomial fitting, the order of your polynomial, things like this. Um, so you may want to choose the hyperparameter values that you want to try. So um, for example, if you want to uh, tune your learning rate, you can have different uh, learning rates over here. Uh, and you also want to have the number of iterations switched. So what you then do is do all combinations. So say if you have seven values for the learning rate and 10 values for the number of iterations, that gives you 70 different combinations. And so you train 70 different models. And then you can compare, uh, you can basically just check which one performed best on the validation data. Again, don't test your test data, but look at the training and especially the validation data and see which one works best and keep that one as hyperparameter. Um, you can also do that with a hyperparameter search, but we won't go into that today. All right, next slide. Some bad practices, which you will see quite often. Uh, one is to split data randomly into training, validation, and testing. And I will say that's the classic thing that, that it, it's a psychological trap because uh, in computer science, where most of these algorithms are coming from, quite often the data samples really are independent. You know, if it's different movie recommendations on Netflix, every sample you get is usually a different user from minute to minute or from second to second. So they are independent. And it's very tricky when you transfer things over from computer science to only transfer over what makes sense, but not what doesn't make sense. And so in, in earth sciences, it usually doesn't make sense to do this random are split and things like that because we have the spatial autocorrelation and, the and especially the temporal autocorrelation, which quite often in, in typical computer science applications you do not have. So that's one tricky thing to remember for earth sciences again. And so you will see papers 
where people do not split things properly. Um, and so that is really not a valid analysis then. Confusing validation testing data, and I'm telling you, I've done it before. It happens very, very easily. So you have to make sure you really split into three different things and do not touch the test data until the very end. And then some, sometimes it even happens that uh, people use the same data for training validation and testing, and Ryan wrote here, he's seen that in published papers. It really happens. So uh, read machine learning papers very carefully, and especially if you're a reviewer, you may want to check whether they read um, separated things in training, validation, and testing. I will say there is one other thing that's cross-validation. That's another way of splitting between training and validation. So if they have cross-validation, they only need cross-validation and testing, and we'll get to that in some other lecture. All right, next slide, please. So at the end of this section, we just have a few comments on learning curves, also called convergence curves. Um, so say you're training a model and you, you track during the training how your model performs in the validation data. That can help you detect, number one, whether you have overfitting or underfitting, and number two, whether your model has even converged, whether you should stop or whether you, you should keep going. Um, so what you usually do is that you plot the training and validation performance over a hyperparameter um, and then see for which hyperparameter it performs how. Um, I think in the interest of time, let's just go to the next slide. So here you see an example of a learning curve or convergence curve where you see the loss function over, say, a number of clusters. So in this, this, this could be time, but in this case, it's, it's a clustering algorithm, and you have as hyperparameter the number of clusters. And what you see is a little bit of an elbow here on the validation. So the, the training seems to keep on getting better and better with the number of clusters, but you can up, could end up having just each sample being one cluster. But if you look at the validation curve, you see it goes down under like 70 something, 72, and then it starts going up again. So it really isn't a good idea to keep on increasing your clusters beyond 72. So that would tell you how you would choose your hyperparameter. Next slide. And similarly here, you see it keeps getting better even for validation. Training hasn't changed much, but the validation is getting better, so you're better off with a higher number of clusters. You could have the same kind of plot using a network and training over time, and then you would, it would tell you also um, whether it flattens out or not and whether you should keep going or not. And I think that concludes this section, and we'll quickly go to the next section, back to Ryan. All right, so this is going to be the last section for today, and this is on model evaluation. And then um, <clears throat> we're not going to have as much time as we usually will for the CoLab notebook at the end. What we're generally shooting for is 60 minutes of us talking and then 30 minutes of us looking at a CoLab notebook together. Um, but there's a lot of information to get through today. So we're hoping to um, to bring the lecture time down in future lectures. So this section is going to focus mostly on binary classification because for one thing, it's uh, it's easier to talk about. And for another thing, there's some really neat graphics that have been developed for binary classification that don't exist for regression. So I'm going to start off talking about binary classification and then kind of circle back to regression at the end. Um, so for binary classification, when you're just predicting a yes or no thing, most evaluation scores are based in the contingency table, or sometimes people call this the confusion matrix. And this is what a contingency table looks like at the bottom. So you have a, um, you've, you've got the, uh, the, the columns and the rows. So the columns are telling you what the observation was, so whether the event occurred or not. So let's just, we'll stick with the tornado example. So the columns are telling you whether a tornado occurred or not, and the rows are telling you what the forecast was. So if you're, if you're in the yes and yes cell, that means that the forecast was yes and the observation was yes. So that's a hit or a true positive. Um, B is the number of false positives or false alarms where your forecast was yes, but the thing didn't happen. C is your number of false negatives or misses where the thing happened, but you didn't forecast it. And then D is your number of true negatives or correct nulls where the forecast and the observation are both no. So you said there's going to be no tornado when there was no tornado. So most of the scores you see for binary classification are based on this A, B, C, and D in the contingency table. Uh, what you'll notice is that when I was talking about logistic regression, that left-hand side of the regression equation, that Y was a probability. 
it wasn't a um, it wasn't a deterministic answer. It wasn't just a yes or no. So before you can create a contingency table, you need to choose a probability threshold because almost every machine learning model that does classification will output probabilities. It won't output straight yeses and nos. So you've got to choose a threshold to get that probability into straight a straight yes or no. And Ema? maybe based, based on the discussion we had earlier, just in your mind, uh, replace probability by confidence. It's a confidence threshold. It's not exactly probability. So just in your mind, replace it. Good call. Pseudo probability, um, not the philosophical definition of probability. So you need to choose a probability threshold, which is P star. And then the way you create your deterministic forecast is you just look at the probability. And if the probability is greater than or equal to P star, you call the forecast a yes or a one. And if the probability you forecast is less than the threshold P star, then you call it a zero forecast or a no forecast. Um, and P star is also a hyperparameter. So if you have a modeling problem where you, whoever your, your client or end user is, you need to give them deterministic answers instead of just probabilities, that means you need to choose this P star. You need to choose a probability threshold that you're going to use in the end when you apply this model in the wild. And then that becomes another hyperparameter that you have to tune and play with. So there's a few commonly used scores based in the contingency, on the contingency table. You've probably seen uh, at least a few of these before. So there's probability of detection. That's the number of hits over the number of events. So the number of correctly forecast tornadoes over the number of tornadoes. Probability of false detection is the number of false alarms over the number of non-events. So the number of false alarms over the number of non-tornadoes. Success ratio is the, um, the number of hits over the number of positive forecasts. So the number of successful tornado warnings over the number of total tornado warnings. False alarm ratio is one minus the success ratio, so it's the number of uh, false alarms over the number of positive forecasts. So the number of tornado warnings that don't verify over the total number of tornado warnings. Uh, frequency of correct nulls, almost no one ever looks at that. Um, I, I'll skip over that one. Accuracy is just the fraction of predictions that are correct. So it's number of true positives, which is A, plus number of true negatives, which is D, divided by all your contingency table elements, so A plus C plus D. A plus B plus C plus D, or just N, which is the total number of examples. Then critical success index is accuracy, but without correct nulls. So if you just get rid of the D in the numerator and denominator, you end up with critical success index. And then frequency bias is the number of positive forecasts over the number of events. So the number of forecast tornadoes over the number of actual tornadoes, which you want that to be as close to one as possible. Um, so like I just said, Frequency bias, the optimal value is 1, and it ranges anywhere from 0 to infinity. The Most of the values I just showed you on the last slide, probability of detection, success ratio, frequency of correct nulls, accuracy, and critical success index, all range from 0 to 1, and they're positively oriented, so the best value is 1. And then probability of false detection and false alarm ratio, the POFD and FAR, also range from 0 to 1, but they're negatively oriented, so the optimal value is 0. You don't want to have false detections, and you don't want to have false alarms. Um, and CSI, the accuracy without correct nulls, is useful under two conditions, probably more, but these are what I see as being the main two. When correct nulls are difficult to verify, or when correct nulls are trivial to predict. So for the tornado problem, we have both of these conditions. Um, Correct nulls are often difficult to verify because many tornadoes go unreported. So if you don't have a report, that doesn't mean you didn't have a tornado. Um, so it's it's useful to just get rid of the true negatives in the accuracy formula. And also, many non-tornado cases are easy to predict. For example, if you if you're predicting on a storm by storm basis and you have some shallow convection embedded in the stratiform region of an MCS that technically meets the 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 threshold to be called a storm cell you know that storm's going to be non-tornadic. It's a really easy non-tornado forecast. Um, or if you're predicting tornadoes on a day-by-day -day basis and you're in International Falls, Minnesota, and it's minus 40 in January, it's pretty easy to say there's going to be no tornado today. <clears throat> um, so the main disadvantage of contingency tables is that they ignore probabilistic information that your machine learning model gives you or confidence, inf inf confidence information. Um, for example, if you set a probability threshold of 30% and then you have three cases with forecasts of 30, 70, and 100%, they're all converted to just a yes. So uh, 
getting rid of probabilities and just going to deterministic forecasts washes out the differences between those three forecasts. One way around this is to create contingency tables for many different thresholds, and there's some common graphics that use contingency tables for many different thresholds. Um, so for example, rock curves and performance diagrams, which are the ones we see most often in atmospheric science. So the end of this lecture is going to talk about rock curves and performance diagrams, and then we're going to talk about reliability curves real quick. And then um, we're going to have maybe 10 minutes to go through that CoLab notebook and show you a couple of things. Um, so the rock, the rock curve plots POD, probability of detection, versus POFD, probability of false detection, over many different thresholds. And if you if you use enough probability thresholds to create your curve, in this case, I used 1001 because I went, um, I used thresholds of zero and then 0.1% and 0.2%, et cetera, et cetera, going up to 100.0%. So you end up with 1001 points in this rock curve. It looks like a continuous curve, but often people only use 10 or 20 different probability thresholds. So it looks a little bit more jaggy, but either way, the same thing is being plotted. So each point in this curve corresponds to one probability threshold. For the lowest probability threshold, for probability threshold of zero, everything becomes a yes forecast. So your POD is one and your POFD is one and you're at the top right of the curve. Then for a probability threshold of one, everything becomes a negative forecast. So your POFD goes down to zero and your POD goes down to zero and then you're at the bottom left. And generally what you want to see in a rock curve is you want to be as close to the top left or the northwest as possible. Um, so there's two numbers you can use to summarize the goodness of a rock curve. One is the maximum per score. So per score is something I've contoured. Um, I think people generally don't create rock curves this way, but I like looking at them this way with per score contoured in the background. Per score is just the, POF, the POD minus the POFD. So it ranges from minus one to plus one, and the higher scores are the better scores. And the maximum per score always occurs at the northwesternmost point or the top leftmost point in the rock curve, as you can see if you look at these contours. So in this case, the, the maximum per score is 0 0.64 or something like that, and it's around this, uh, this region of the curve. Another way to summarize how good a rock curve is, is is to look at the area under the curve. So you integrate using the trapezoid rule or Simpson's rule or whatever your favorite rule is to figure out the area under this thing. And the area under the curve can vary anywhere from zero to one. So if your curve follows this dashed x equals y line, that means your AUC is 0 0.5. And that actually means that your model is no better than a random predictor. So you would literally do just as well flipping a coin. So if you see a rock curve that lies along this line or not too far above it, that's a really, really bad predictor. Um, if you see a rock curve that's somehow below this random line, that means your performance is worse than random, which raises a lot of questions probably a bug in someone's code. Um, and generally, if you have an AUC of 0 0.9 or greater, the model is considered excellent. <clears throat> I think in this case, the AUC is 0 0.88 or something like that. So this is a, uh, a pretty good model. So the second type of graphic I'm going to talk about, again, this one does binary classification only. And this graphic is called performance diagrams. This is something that was actually invented fairly recently by Paul Rubber at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, who's a meteorologist. He invented these back in 2009, but they've become pretty copiously used, especially by machine learning folks. So the performance diagram is a little bit different than the rock curve. In the rock curve, you see POD on the y-axis and POFD on the x-axis. For a performance diagram, it's still POD on the y-axis, but then you're plotting success ratio, or 1 minus the false alarm ratio, on the x-axis. Um, and these are both values that you want to be as high as possible. So for the rock curve, you want to see the curve in the top left. But for a performance diagram, you want to see the curve in the top right, as close to the top right as possible. Again, excuse me, each point in this curve corresponds to one probability threshold, p star. So for p star of 0, that's um, that would be this point at the bottom right. P, so when you. Um, is that right? No, it's not. I've I've messed something up. Well, we'll just um, we'll we'll skip past that. I'll fix these slides later on before we send them out. Uh, also, you can contour a couple things in the background of a, of a performance diagram. So you can contour critical success index. It increases towards the top right because performance diagrams get better as you go to the top right. And you can also contour frequency bias, which is usually done with these dashed contour lines. So you want to have a really high CSI, and you want to be along this one-to-one -one line, because you want your frequency bias to be as close to one as possible. 
because that's the number of forecast events over the number of actual events. So you don't want to have a frequency bias of like two or three because that's huge over prediction. And if you have a frequency bias of like 0.25 or 0.50, that's huge under prediction. <clears throat> so there's two ways you can summarize the goodness of a performance diagram. You can look at, again, the area under the curve, or you can look at the maximum CSI, which in this case is uh, 0.37 or 0.38, something like that. But there's no universal standard for a good performance diagram, whereas there kind of is for a rock curve. Generally, if you see an AUC of 0 0.9, everyone agrees that's a really good rock curve. Um, but if you see uh, an area of 0.2 under your performance diagram or, or an area of 0.8 or whatever, there's no, um, there's no universal standard for how good or bad that is. The reason is that performance diagrams are highly sensitive to event frequency because for rare events like tornadoes, it's really hard to get a high CSI because getting a high CSI requires you to get a high POD and then a low false alarm ratio or a high success ratio. And that's just hard to do because getting a high POD means you have to issue a lot of tornado warnings or positive tornado forecasts. Um, but at the same time, to get a low false alarm ratio, you have to issue a lot of positive forecasts for a rare event. And then you have to have a small number of those positive forecasts be false alarms. And for a rare event, it's just hard to do. So you tend to see lower CSIs and you tend to see performance diagrams on the bottom left. So for some forecasting problems, you can have a performance diagram down here with a maximum CSI of like 0.15. And people are like, hey, that's amazing. That outperforms the state of the art. Whereas for some prediction problems, you can have a CSI of 0.7 and people are like, oh, that's garbage. We have lots of better methods. So it really depends on the problem. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about reliability curves. And then we're going to get a little bit fancier and put some reference lines in the background and turn them into attributes diagrams. So for a binary classification problem, the reliability curve plots forecast probability versus conditional event frequency. So forecast prob is on the x-axis, and then conditional event frequency is on the y-axis. So this reliability curve answers the question, given a forecast probability of p, how likely is the event to occur? You want this reliability curve to be along the x equals y line or the one-to-one -one line, because you want, a, you want a model where if it forecasts 40% tornado probability, tornadoes actually occur 40% of the time. And if you say 80%, you want the event to occur 80% of the time. You don't want a model that looks like this. This is a classic sigmoid-shaped reliability curve where if you look at for, uh, the forecast probability of 0.4 or 40%, the event only happens 15% of the time when you predict 40%. So you're you're overconfident or you're overpredicting. And then if you get to the higher ranges of forecast probability, you're underpredicting. For a forecast probability of 70%, the conditional event frequency is something like 95%. So that means in cases where you say tornado probability 70%, you can actually expect a tornado 95% of the time. Um, so that's a bad thing. And as I promised, uh, I promised to loop back to regression at the end of the lectures, so we're doing that now. So you can plot reliability curves not just for binary classification, but you can do it for regression. So in this case, you're plotting the forecast value on the x-axis and the um, conditional mean observation on the y-axis. So what this is telling you, for example, if you look at this data point here for ridiculously low temperatures, which I enjoy, um, on the left-hand side of the reliability curve, this is telling you when the forecast temperature is minus 65 Fahrenheit, the, uh, the, the mean actual value is minus 58 or minus 57. So that means that you're, um, you're under-predicting. Your prediction is too low. And then as you get towards the higher ranges of the prediction scale, when you predict 25 degrees, the conditional mean observation is something like 18. So that means your prediction is too high. Whereas in the middle ranges of this forecast temperature scale, you're pretty good because you're really close to that x equals y line. Um, so for both regression and classification, the dashed gray line means perfect reliability. When you have a point below the gray line, that means your model is predicting too high, or you say that it's overconfident. And for points above the gray line, your model is predicting too low, or you say that it's underconfident. Um, and the final thing I'm going to look at, yeah, only two more slides here. I see that we're, uh, oh, we are getting low on time. Okay. I think Ema just said something about the notebook in the chat. Yeah, I just said that the notebook was, was sent out, but let's okay. just wrap it up as quickly as possible, but we have a few minutes at least for that. Okay, sure. Um, in that case, uh, maybe we can leave this as future reading or cover it at the beginning of the next lecture because it's only two slides. Um, take home point attributes diagrams or fancy reliability curves that have a bunch of reference lines and histograms in the background. 
and they can be really dizzying to look at if you're just looking at them for the first time but I find that they give you a whole lot of information, so I find them really useful tools, tools for model evaluation. Um, and at the bottom of the slides, but you also got it in an email earlier today, there's the link to the Colab notebook. And I want to say that the data set and pre-processing was all provided by David John Gagne II, who's at NCAR now, and um, there's an original notebook that mine is based on that he wrote as well. So he, um, he had a major hand in doing all of this stuff. Um, and then there's the uh, the appendix at the end for people who want to learn about matrix inversion. So <clears throat> I can, uh, yeah, really quickly go through the notebook because we, okay, we have more minutes than I thought. I thought we were at 227. Okay, so that's a little bit better. Um, please either speak up or tell me in the chat if you can't access the notebook for some reason. I emailed the link um, right at the beginning of this session, so about an hour and a half ago. And Ema just put it in the chat as well. <clears throat> so once you've loaded up this notebook, the uh, the only thing you have to do to to make it work, I got a thumbs up from someone. Thank you. Um, you're you're gonna have to click connect at the top right. I'll um maybe I'll disconnect just so you can see what that looks like. Uh, terminate. Okay, so you'll have a button up here that says connect or reconnect. So you'll want to do that. That will connect you to a virtual runtime, which we talked about last week, so it's a fancy Google Cloud computer. Um, and all the uh, all the sections here that say required are code sections that you're going to have to run before you can do anything else. So just, um, I think what we'll do in the interest of time is just motor through these, uh, these first few code cells and run them. So again, to run, you click the play button, or you can hit control enter or shift enter whatever you prefer. So I'm just going to motor through these first few code cells. Anything that's in red text that says required is something you have to run. Otherwise, stuff later in the notebook won't work. And there's some, uh, for, for the people who really, um, for, for the concepts that, that didn't sink in today, if you want to read about overfitting and different words or training validation and testing in different words, there's some little uh, mini slides that I've put in the middle of the CoLab notebook as well. So if you um, if you learn by having things restated for you, you may want to take a look at that. So these first few code cells are just importing the Python packages we need, um, doing housekeeping stuff basically, downloading the input data, and then reading the input data. So the input data we have are a whole bunch of storms. Um, each each observation or each example in this case is one storm object. So it's one storm cell at one time step. And the predictor variables are the ones that I went over on that uh, that one slide near the beginning here. So there's there's these 41 predictor variables that are listed in the bullet points. They're mostly just spatial statistics taken on reflectivity, temperature, U wind, and V wind inside the storm. And uh, then the target variable is the maximum future vorticity that's achieved anywhere inside the storm boundary. Um, You'll also have to run this little code cell that, sit, uh, that says, uh, the one that says code required under normalization. <clears throat> and that should run really quickly. That should be a three second thing. That's just normalizing all the predictor values into Z scores. Um, so the uh, really the only things I want to show you here, because again, we're running out of time, are uh, if you go to the linear regression section, you should have this table of contents on the left-hand side, so you should be able to just click on titles. So go to training for linear regression, and this shows you how to train a linear regression model. The uh, A lot of the details are hidden in this utils.py file, but this is part of the GitHub repository. Um, so for people who, if you don't have a link to the GitHub repository, um, let me know and I'll send you that, because this is completely open source. So if you want to look inside utils.py and look at what's inside this mo this method called train linear regression, you can see it all. So it's not meant to be a black box. Um, so in this case, I'm setting up a linear regression model with no regularization because lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both 0, and then just training that linear regression model. <clears throat> so I'm training a model to look at all these predictors that are uh, spatial statistics inside a storm, and then predict what the maximum future vorticity will be inside the storm. And then the next code cell evaluates the linear regression model that we just trained on both the training and validation data, I think, yes. 
So here we get, this is a, an attributes diagram, which I was showing you at the end of the lecture notes. So it's a, it's, a, it's a reliability curve with some fancy reference lines in the background. So here you're seeing the attributes diagram on the training data, and it looks really, really good. This, um, you can ignore the reference lines in the background and just pretend this is a reliability curve. So the reliability curve is really close to that one-to-one -one line, which means that the model is super reliable when it forecasts 0 0.004 inverse seconds, the observation, the mean observation is 0 0.004 inverse seconds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then when we look at the validation data, the performance is still pretty good, although at the, the higher ends of the prediction scale, um, the model is underconfident, so it's underpredicting. So when the model forecast 0 0.006 inverse seconds, the, the mean actual value is 0 0.007 inverse seconds. So it's not capturing the extreme values very well. Another thing you can do for linear or log regression is you can just plot the coefficients in the model. So that's the next code cell down here, section coefficients under linear regression. You can just run this code cell and you should get a nice bar plot showing you the values of the coefficients. And the way to interpret this is just a a positive value means that your prediction of maximum future vorticity increases with that predictor variable. And if your coefficient value is negative, that means the prediction decreases with that predictor variable. So if you look at the really high bars here, the ones that have large positive values, they're uh, the maximum V wind inside the storm, that's this bar up here, the maximum U wind inside the storm, the 90th percentile of reflectivity inside the storm, the maximum reflectivity inside the storm, and the mean reflectivity inside the storm. So what these five bars are telling you is, hey, if you want to increase the maximum future vorticity achieved by a storm, increase the wind inside the storm and increase the composite reflectivity inside the storm. Um, and both of those, those relationships make sense. Uh, storms with higher reflectivity generally have stronger updrafts, and the um, the, the U wind and V wind, these are, are coming out of a uh, convection allowing model at three kilometer resolution. So these are not the storm scale wind, they're kind of the, the mesoscale wind in the region of the storm. But generally, if you have higher, uh, if you have higher wind speeds in the ambient environment, you're gonna have higher wind speeds and more vorticity inside the storm as a result. Um, so those relationships all make conceptual sense to me. And then, uh, the one the one bar with a large negative value is the standard deviation of reflectivity inside the storm. So this is saying if you want to increase maximum future vorticity, you should decrease the standard deviation of reflectivity. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure what the physical interpretation of that is, um, but it may mean that uh, you you want your storm to be more coherent. You don't want um, you don't you don't want a bunch of holes inside your storm. You don't want your storm to have some sort of a weird shape or structure. Um, but we're running out of time. Uh, so the last thing I'll, I'll show you really briefly is that we have a couple uh, examples of hyperparameter experiments in here, or hyperparameter tuning, which Ema was talking about in section five. So you can see how a full hyperparameter experiment is done. So how you go through the training, you train models with a bunch of different hyperparameters, you validate them, so you evaluate every single model on the validation data, and then you select the model that performs best on the validation data, and then you choose that model, and you look at how well it performs on testing data. Um, so I think that's a really useful component of this notebook for people who end up uh, dabbling in machine learning themselves and becoming practitioners. And I just wanted to add, our hope is, of course, within the 15 minutes, or so, Ryan, could you turn off your microphone for a second? So within the 15 minutes or half an hour, you don't have that much time to look through the CoLab notebook, but now you have an idea what it's all about, and we're hoping that you will go through that a little bit on your own time between sessions. So that's the idea behind that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ryan. I think we need to wrap it up. Yeah, I think it's about time to wrap it up. Um, so the, the rest of what I'll say is just uh, if you look at the table of contents in this notebook, you can see what it contains. Uh, normalization is the one pre-processing thing we didn't talk about today, which maybe I'll throw into lecture three. Um, and we'll start lecture three with attributes diagrams so that you can have all these reference lines and histograms and stuff explained to you. So we'll make sure that we don't skip over that. Um, but yeah, uh, this this notebook is mostly showing you how to do linear regression, how to do logistic regression, how to throw in L1 and L2 regularization, and then also how to run a hyperparameter experiment. And in this case, the, the goal is picking the best 
the the best lambda one and lambda two values, so the best regularization strengths for L1 and L2. Um, so there's there's lots of practical stuff in here. If you ever want to use code that comes out of one of my notebooks, I just ask that you cite me. Um, but otherwise, it's completely open source. It's under the uh, the MIT license, so you can use absolutely whatever you want. Um, and with that, uh, if anyone has questions, I'll stick around for another five or ten minutes if you want to ask me questions in the chat or if you want to just speak up and ask me questions by audio. Otherwise, uh, email is always good. I'll answer any questions that are emailed to me. And uh, we'll see everyone next week. Thank you. We said I stopped the recording, but we still hang out here.